Hello, welcome back to my channel. Or welcome if you're new here. I feel like that's what all of the YouTubers have been saying recently. Um, it's been a while and I want to do a nice cozy catch up. I want to do a big catch up. Um, yeah, talk about some books, talk about some other things I've been liking. Um, Pato asked me to do a what's in my bag, which I think I will do at the end. Yeah, reading philosophy, themes for winter reading, that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, the, the biggest, I think, update is I'm in a new place. I, yeah, I, I moved to a new place um, like two months ago. I have a new job, just kind of transitioning into, um, yeah, new life stuff. Um, it's been great. I love my place. I want to do more filming here. I just, honestly, yeah, I've had a lot of difficulty trying to like keep up with normal life stuff and then also keep up with like reading and then like filming. I need a win. I need a quick win. And that's what this is going to be. I'm going to try to just film, upload, minimal edit, drinking tea. I have a project of knitting and then, um, yeah, I want to talk about a bunch of books that I have engaged with since I last, um, updated updated everyone. Okay, so these are the books in the order that I read them. The first is Stay True, um, which is a memoir that I listened to on audiobook. Um, I think this won the Pulitzer Prize for memoir. It won some big award. I was originally interested in this because the author went to Berkeley, um, is like, you know, spent time in the Bay Area, and um, it was being talked about in Kind of the local book world and I was like that's interesting um and I knew it was like he's kind of a, he's a photographer or some type of creative and it was about his time here in Berkeley um like in the early 2000s and um his his best friend dying um in college and I think this this was good I enjoyed it I don't really I feel like I don't have too many strong opinions about it right now because it's been months since I finished it. At least two months, yeah. Um, it was it was fine. I don't. I think this might have been an issue of too much hype a little bit when you hear about a memoir being so good. It's like the last memoir I think that really stood up to its name is Crying in H Mart for me. Um, but this was good. I think. Um, the narration is really um, writing kind of from the perspective, like the mindset of um, the author at his age where he thought he was so troubled and different than everyone and listened to better music and watched better movies and had better politics and like, I think it's, in, it, it's, it's rich in that kind of men that mindset. Um, it is annoying, <laughs> regardless of how self-aware it might be. Um, yeah, I thought it was fine, to be honest. It, did, it just didn't really blow me away. Um, I think I kind of kept expecting there to be something, uh, things to be for a deeper revelation. Um, the relationship with the, with the friend was really beautiful. Um, just kind of their unlikely bond. And I think, I guess that part was nice. The way, the kind of grieving afterwards, um, I mean, I'm sure it was like honest, but uh, it didn't feel particularly like, it didn't really pull on my um, emotions a lot. So that's that. Second one I read was, Okay, I guess the, the second one I read was Space Invaders, and this is a, it's a novel, but it's very, very short. It's like 70 pages, I would say a novella, um, translated from Spanish, and it is uh, set in Chile, I believe, um, during the, uh, what 
is his name? Uh, it's not Pinochet. Pinochet re re regime the uh, the fascist time, and it is really interesting in its form. It takes. Um, it uses the plural we often, not always, but often, and it's following a group of friends in elementary school. Yeah, like young group of friends. Um, their all of all of their memories of this one particular girl that they went to school with, um, and her uh, their memories of her, um, kind of as a collective. The story will sometimes go into kind of. The perspective of each person um, within the group, but it's more about this uh, collective we, the collective memory of this childhood uh, friend to childhood classmate that had an impact on them, um, and kind of the way they all experienced a like violent, repressed time, um, where like in their country while they were kids and growing up. Um, and I thought it was really, it was beautiful. It was um, different. I think it's published by a smaller press. It's the type of thing that like, if you're looking for um, something like original, something different that a smaller uh, indie publisher is putting out, um, this is a great, a great option. Okay, third on the list is the Lonely City uh, by Olivia Liang. This was an incredible, incredible book. I think one of my favorites of the year. I listened to it on audiobook, um, excuse me, which was highly inspired by Sophie from Biblio Sophie because I think months ago she was listening to it on audiobook. Um, and there was something about that, like listening about urban loneliness in this, you know, it, I, I was inspired. And so, uh, I did that. I really enjoyed it. Um, I would not have expected one of my favorite books of the year to be this, uh, like nonfiction book about visual artists. Um, but I loved it. I think Olivia Liang is an author for the girlies who want nuance, like desperately need nuance at all times, at any kind of reading or anything they're absorbing. <laughs> I love the way they think, like the way they think makes so much sense to me. I get a real sense of um, all the cards being laid out on the table and feeling like I'm getting a a balanced understanding of uh, some of the critiques of, of visual artists and their art as well as uh, what they bring to the table. I'm kind of, I'm not talking about what the actual book is, let me, let me get to that. The Lonely City is, kind of, is a nonfiction book where um, its basis is the the author was spending a particularly lonely bout of time in their lives uh, in New York City, um, experiencing urban loneliness themselves, and then um, writes this book where each chapter is exploring different visual artists that lived in New York City who their work either actively or unintentionally engaged with themes of urban loneliness. Um, and so there's like Edward Hopper, Andy Warhol, um, some other names. Uh, and it's, it's, it's incredible, the, the, the narrative that's painted. Um, I never even really, I've always never really engaged with artists like Edward Hopper or Andy Warhol because I, I remember when I was younger, I, I think I originally, when I started seeing Andy Warhol in the like, when I started going to modern art museums and thinking like, oh, this is cool. And then learning a little bit about his history, some of his problematic nature, and then being like, actually he's canceled. Like, I don't like it. This book, I think is the first time I've really been able to understand 
Andy Warhol as the visual artist, like as an idea, um, who he was more as a person, uh, and just, and this is, this is, this applies to every artist that the book goes through, but you really get a sense of feeling like, yeah, like you've gotten this, like a real fully fledged idea of this person's life, the conditions that, uh, made them deeply lonely, uh, their ostracization, how they hurt other people, um, their limiting beliefs, uh, you know, because of or um, related to their loneliness, not necessarily in a justifying sense, just kind of explaining how it is. Um, yeah, I felt that way with like, uh, Edward Hopper, like he had these really uh, incredible pieces of work on urban loneliness that he kind of, he rejected that concept, but like, and then his absolute refusal to see his wife as an equal and be someone that could help with his loneliness, um, just, yeah, it was, I really feel like I got a sense of all of the different shadings, like all the nuance of these people, them as artists, their art themselves. Uh, it was, it, it's exactly the type of nonfiction work I like that's like engaging with, uh, with this, with art, but with a real sense of heart and the real sense of of wanting to convey uh honestly to actual like actually to the public instead of just uh art critique or art history for the sake of for the sake of it for the academia for the uh, uh to be only be able to understood by certain people um with you know, the right degrees. And I just, it, I don't know, it was incredible. I think I'm kind of just going on and on, but I loved that book. Um, I highly, highly recommend it. Um, next was Too Much and Not the Mood by Darga Chubwa's Bose. Um, I read this as a kind of buddy read with, um, uh, I don't know, it was a light buddy read, let's say. We were all kind of generally reading um, this book between Pato, Iggy, and our friend Cami. Um, and it was incredible. Um, how do I, okay, so I actually was originally exposed to this book by one of my um, closest friends who read this like years ago and was like, you would really like this, you should read this. Um, and I was like, I would, and then just never got around to it. And I'm, I really regret it because um, the first essay is, so it's a collection of essays and like kind of personal essays, um, but the first one is, takes up like half of the book. It's called Heart Museum. Yeah, it's like the main chunk. This is one, this is kind of the rest, I think. And that first essay, absolutely incredible. Um, this is another writer who I just, I really resonate with the way that they think about things, like their observations. Um, yeah, Durga, like Durga Chubwa's in the first essay, I guess maybe all of their, their style of writing is extremely granular um, in the sense that like the first essay is kind of just like a very long meandering uh sequence of these like moments uh, really visceral small moments um that are very i think either uh, visually striking or like a scent or some kind of sensory experience that um she kind of like it really just expands into and kind of like takes it's like a piece of salt and then like looking at it really carefully and like seeing all the crystals. Um, that's what it feels like reading this. Yeah, it was another book that is so, full of so much heart and 
warmth and just like desire to understand the world, make sense of it. Um, I really, really uh, felt seen by um, specifically the first essay. I think a lot of people who have talked about this book, they mention um, the rest of the essays, not really living up to that uh, the standard of the first one. I just say I agree. I didn't like the other ones as much. Um, I liked some of the ones of like kind of her growing up. Um, a lot, yeah, the, the rest of them are pretty like a lot shorter and I don't know if that has anything to do with the fact that they, they're less successful. Um, this, this type of personal essay of a uh, like a, a woman of color that is writing about kind of identity and things like that, um, that kind of category of essays. I think it was written kind of during like the height of that. Um, and I can see it being, I hate to use this word, but like timely, maybe like you know, 2015 to 2018, I don't know, when did this come out? 2017. Um, and just kind of her exploring like what it means to have her name pronounced correctly, what it means to uh, go to school wishing you were one of the cool older white girls, what it means to have people, your friends be like in the summer be like, oh, I'm almost as tan as you, things like this. Um, you know, you know, coming, reconciling with your, um, the past of your immigrant parents, all of these things are interesting to read. I want to read about them. I think maybe the way that they're kind of wrapped up a little neatly in a bow has something to do with the time in which they were being written and feels kind of like there was this need to like, make a coherent conclusion out of the way she thought about those topics when I am really, I think, at least right now, for me, for my reading, I want to uh, problematize those conclusions more, uh, allow them to just allow these topics to just kind of sit there without this like conclusion or call to action or I don't know. So, um, yeah, but I loved it. I should have read this sooner. Um, and you should read it too. I just finished literally yesterday, the white book, um, which I buddy read with Nathan, Nathan Snook. Um, it was incredible. I did not know it was going to be what it was. Uh, I don't know if this is an accurate way of talking about it, um, but to me, as someone who doesn't read a lot of poetry, it read very poetic. It's just these fragments where um, the narrator is writing on the theme, different things that um, are white, that she sees, interacts with. Um, and so that's kind of like the structure. It's like these different things that are white, right? And then she, the kind of, theme, or I don't want to say plot, but thing that's kind of rolling through all of this is grief. Um, and the narrator is kind of dealing with grief, uh, I believe, of the close family member, a um, miscarried child of their mother, like the, uh, an unborn sibling, perhaps. Um, perhaps, I don't know why I said that. Uh, but yeah, kind of grief in, in many ways. Um, the narrator is from Seoul and then I believe moves to a cold Northern European country, like Germany maybe. There's mentions of the cities, um, of Britland's like what I think was the, uh, the wall. So yeah, I think it was, it was Berlin. Um, so the narrator is kind of like in this new place. They're kind of isolate. They're trying to 
take the time to uh, reckon with the grief they've experienced. Um, it's not entirely, it's not like particularly really sad or puts you in like kind of a weird dark space. Um, I would say it's heavy, uh, but not particularly in a bad way. It, it, um, it, get, it feels good, extremely beautiful. Um, just ways, yeah, once again, another, a real theme of this, this reading, particularly with Too Much Not the Mood and the White Book is, um, what did I say? Oh, like just an appreciation of the small things, like a writing that's really skilled in uh, bringing out those granular moments. Um, yeah, it was really good. And then I have two books that I tried to read and decided against DNF. Um, I mean, I like very, I barely started them. So, uh, controversial hot take. I tried to read Ava Balthazar's Permafrost, um, and I didn't like it. I read like the first couple pages. Yeah, like the first two chapters. No, 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 no. It, the way it, it's kind of, the back describes it is no bullshit lesbian narrator, um, wickedly funny observer of modern life, desperate to get out of Barcelona, goes to Brussels. Um, I think she plays, she is an au pair at one point. Um, I just, really did not like the, uh, I didn't want to get into the, the headspace that the narrator is in. Like the first chapter is her like talking about how great it would be to uh, off themselves and which like that as a topic isn't necessarily something that's like too sensitive for me to read about, but just and then the second chapter is about how like anyone that like basically just criticizing people who take medication to like manage their mental health in contemporary life like they're like weak and fake and like not experiencing real life it's just the the perspective is really someone who is obviously not well adjusted is dealing with mental health issues and like has that really pessimistic view of the world where they like kind of think they're better than everyone else for having these issues in a weird way. I, that sounds kind of intense. I don't think that, I don't know. I think there, there could be a time and a place in which I would want to read from this perspective. I'm just not, um, I don't really want it right now. Like as much as I like unlikable narrators, I just don't, I don't want to be in someone's head like that right now. It's not really what I'm looking for. Um, and it just felt like the narr like it, the narrator's in their 20s. It felt like it was like a teenager complaining. Um, sorry, that's my truth. Um, the other one is, and I bought this too, which kind of sucks, but um, this is The Fell, which is by Sarah Moss. And I found this, um, in a free library. It's an advanced uh, reader copy. I'm telling you, people around me in the East Bay, they got those literary connects. Um, this is a pandemic baby. It is literally about a woman, like uh, a woman, she's supposed to be in quarantine, goes for a walk in her neighborhood and falls or something? I don't know. Something happens, but um, it's kind of, at least like the, the beginning parts that I read were, were just about kind of pandemic life, being stuck in quarantine. Um, it seems like domestic family issues. I don't think that would be kind of like, once again, there could have been a time and a place where I would be into this. I just kind of am not that interested. Like I don't really care. The stakes don't feel that high to me. Um, yeah, I just want to, I'd rather read something else that I care more about. Um, and then 
what I'm reading right now is Iris Murdoch's The Sacred and Profane Love Machine, also influenced by um, Kat from Catsfield's Notes and Nathan, I think we already read this together. Insane cover. Amazing. Um, amazing title. Plotty story. There's a cheating in a marriage, a love affair. Um, I just really like the way it's written. It feels like a darker version of an Anne Pratchett story. Um, and I really like the kind of bird's eye uh, style narration of like kind of just going through all these different the characters in the family. Um, yeah, there's kind of like a, a theatrical sense to it. Just started though. Um, looking forward to this one. Yeah, those are those are the books. Um, I talked about kind of my reading philosophy. Um, I've been talking about this, I think, pretty frequent, like enough times on my channel where I, yeah, I'm trying to move away from like reading a lot and just kind of trying to be more intentional with my reading um, and just being okay with like having periods where I don't read that much. For the rest of the year, I'm going to try to read uh, just kind of plotty, just books where things happen, where there's a plot, where um, I can really kind of think about um, characters, their motivations, why people do the things they do. I, I feel like I am re-seeking re out the, yeah, the kind of narration style where there's more than one character and <laughs> you get to kind of see how they decide to, like, yeah, the decisions they make based off of their conditions. I find that really interesting. Um, yeah, less like, I just want to read about how people try to do things that they believe is right to the best of their ability and then the consequences of it and, you know, the things that, I don't know, I, I, I like with permafrost, I just really, I want to avoid the like, unlikable female character that's just like, I'm so different and no one under- I, I, I really don't want to like, no one understands me character. I can't have that right now. Not this winter. Um, yeah, I want a book of, of people actively trying to understand each other. That's what I want. Um, yeah, if you have Rex for me, let me know. It's in my bag. The bag in question is probably like the nicest bag I've ever owned. This I got this for work because I was like, I'm gonna go in the office, like I need my lap I wanna have my laptop. I kind of work on like a university setting, so I don't want people I don't want a backpack, I don't want people to think I'm a student. I need like a I'm I'm an adult bag. Okay. I got the bucket bag from J. Crew. It's like $200, which I think I know in like the grand world of bags is not, it's not like a designer bag. It's not actually that expensive, but it's the most I've ever spent on a bag. Um, and it is, it's real leather um, and real suede. I love the two-tone part of it so much. I think it's really, um, it's interesting, but it's also very, very, um, like a, a basic, like a staple that I feel like I can wear all the time and I will like for a long period of time. It's just like literally a giant bucket. It has these like little things that you can tie to like close the bag, but it doesn't really close. Um, normally this has my laptop in it. It does fit this guy. And then I have, obviously the biggest issue with this bag is that it has no pockets and nothing inside. Um, if I was like a super organized person, I would have like everything in little pouches, but I try that and then it doesn't really last. Have my really nice fancy headphones. Um, these are the Bose, you know, whatever they are. You've probably seen them. Um, I love them. They look... 
I do wear these out and about with the noise cancellation off. Um, they are, you know, they're silly, but I like it when I'm walking by myself because it feels protective and like, I feel like because it's like, it doesn't look that good. I feel like men tend to harass me less because it's just like, don't talk to me, you know? Um, I love these. Sometimes if I don't want to carry this though, I will use my um, old hand-me-down air quad, whatever, and it's actually only one of them works, so. <laughs> uh, this is my notebook, my work notebook. Um, I love the color, it's moleskin um, ruled. Yeah, it's like this beautiful color. Um, it's like a nice, I think, fun color for work. And it's just plain striped. I like, it's really necessary for me to write tasks down, um, write notes down. Otherwise, it will not get done and I will not remember it. So, um, love her. I actually have also been kind of using this as a planner. Um, bullet journal kind of thing at the same time. Wow, it's 40 minutes long. Wallet, cute red leather wallet. Um, random sunglasses, nondescript. They're cute. I got them for my eye doctor for free. Like they just were, I think had a bunch of extra that they were giving out. I'm like, I should trust that it has UV whatever is in my doctor, but I also feel like it doesn't. Um, keys, keys to work, my little mini, this is actually the, it's mini, but it's like the one brush I use, love her, I need to brush my hair a lot throughout the day because it's very thin, ooh, my friend gave me this Dr. Bronner's lavender hand sanitizer, and I love it, it's very refreshing. Uh, oh, pen, G2, Pilot G2, classic, love them. Oh my god, these blister things that I had to get because I got new loafers and they absolutely wrecked my heels. Um, I'm walking around with two giant gashes <laughs> and I will never be the same. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like so overpriced, but you need them. And then this, I got, okay, Vaseline, you know, classic. Lips are dry all the time. This is like the one lip thing that I carry with me all the time. I know glossy is kind of cringe now, but I love Leo, this color. I've had it multiple times. I wear it all the time. It's like that really nice brown, 90s brown color, but like sheer enough where it, I can kind of put it on without having to really like pay attention and look in the mirror kind of thing. Like, and then another glossy thing is the Glossy U Roller Bowl, um, which I think, like they, I got it at Sephora because they started selling it at Sephora, but I'm already halfway through. This is incredible. I've always liked the Glossy U scent, but I never wanted to pay for the actual bottle. The Roller Bowl is really nice. Um, I think it's like $30 and you, it just rolls, but um, this is like, people kind of talk about how it's a scent that varies with each person. And then also it's not that strong, like it doesn't last a very long time. So it's just, I think it's kind of nice to just be able to put it on um, in like just more localized places where like you can smell it. Like it smells really, I just like smelling it on myself. Um, you know, I just like having it. I feel like it like pairs well with sweat. <laughs> You know, not too much, just a little. That's it. That's everything in my bag. Here she is. Um, it's reversible, obviously. 
yeah, that was it. Thank you for listening to all this rambling. Um,